So I wanted to begin with the beginning and ask you to just talk in general a little bit about your take on the Brodelian longue durée. Hello. My, my, my take on that, uh, you know, you and I always go back to, to Glissant. And what is wonderful about Glissant is uh, his position of uh, moving but staying in place at the same time. You know, uh, bouger et demeurer. You know, this, this is always uh, uh, very interesting to him because at, in general, it, it was his way uh, of basically not, uh, if you take, for example, uh, roots, roots where people dig deeper and deeper. Gleason believed that the issue is not to dig deeper to find your roots, but the issue is to see uh, c'est l'étendue, l'étendue qui est important pour Glissant, plutôt que uh, la profondeur. So when he talks about that, he, what, what Glissant is trying to say is that uh, rhizomatic. So you look, you take, to be literally a, a Glissantian or delusion, you take one tree here, so instead of worrying about the roots of that tree, you see how that tree is connected to another tree and then you keep going. And then if you apply this to societies, to cultures, it's, what is interesting is how you begin to uh, connect these uh, differences, these different cultures. You, you connect the different cultures and then the result is always unexpected. So uh, long delay in that sense is that you don't lose uh, the past, but you are always repeating the past with some kind of detour, with some kind of contamination. And this idea of contamination was very, very important to, to Gleason. You are moving, but you are always staying in the same place. You know, I don't know if this makes sense. Yeah? No, I love it. Bouger et demeurer. It's a... A, A, au lieu de O, au lieu de Ni, Ni. It's both and instead of either or, instead of no, no. And I'm so happy that you mentioned this song because, of course, you and I and our friendship and many collaborations really started thanks to Edouard because I will never forget how on the occasion of his 80th anniversary, uh, two years before he passed away, when Agnes B hosted his birthday party for him, he took us uh, and literally in a space which was crowded by people, got us together and said, you it's must the, work together. The new morning, the new morning. It's a great jazz place in Paris. Oh, yes, go ahead. And that's where he brought us together in the, in the new morning. And it was the beginning of many collaborations. And indeed his idea of the roots is interesting. And you've written a very beautiful text for the Luma uh, Foundation just last week, which actually talks about that, that we need to celebrate the roots that expand elsewhere, roots that touch each other. They are not singular roots. They are roots that cover and also protect. Now in the text you wrote for Luma, and I think that that's a very beautiful chapter also, which has to do with long durée. It's this very wonderful beginning when you talk about uh, the Plage Noire, the chapter in English Sans book, uh, about this imperative of thinking with the world, uh, about this incredible scene at the, Dime, at the Diamond Beach yes. in Martinique, and this extremely, you know, uh, basically long durational interchange of, of sand. Can you tell us a little bit about, and of course, about the dialogue, about this, about this marching um, against universal truths, and you talk about the story of Glisson who encounters a, a man who doesn't want to speak. Right, right. Well, Gleason was always concerned uh, with the way the Negritude movement, for example, with uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, with uh, Leon Damas and uh, 
uh, Aimé Césaire, they wanted to make a return to Africa. Uh, but they were not, they were generalizing to the point that they were now really looking at the lived experience of Africans, of African diaspora, of people in different places, and how those people are living in history. They are mixing with other people, their lives are changing, and they keep moving and they getting to the points that are not necessarily predictable, as opposed to somebody theorizing a return to the roots. So this was very, very important to Gleason. The negative movement to him was very generalizing. It did not look at what Gleason called le vécu, l'expérience vécu. Remember, this was a very important issue uh, with Fanon too, because both Franz Fanon and Edouard Gleason, even though they saw the value, the necessity of negritude, they thought that negritude was too generalizing, that it was not live, uh, dealing with the lived experience. In fact, one of the chapters in Fanon's Black Skin, My White Mask is l'experience vécu de noir, as opposed to the fact of blackness. So, so, so Gleason, when Gleason come to that, and particularly in this great chapter called Plage Noir, uh, Gleason is again looking at everybody meeting at the beach and they are talking and they are theorizing the future and they are using all these jargons, these wonderful jargons. And they say the problem with Martinique is this and they use psychoanalysis. They say the problem with Martinique is this and they use Marxism. The problem of Marxism is, is this and then they will use a uh, sociology from uh, 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 neoliberal positions. But Gleason said they were not in touch with Martinique. They lived experience of Martinique as an island uh, which is in daily communication with nature, with the ocean that's coming in the morning, the beaches white sand, in the evening the, uh, the beach is black sand, and how human beings should learn, need to learn to tremble with that movement of the ocean, with the movement of the mountains, with the movement, the solidarity with environment. So they need to do that in order to really get in touch with uh, the lived experience of Martinique, instead of all these jargons, all these theories that they were doing. So in the Plage Noir, there is this particular young man who basically stopped talking. He completely stopped talking and he's going back and forth uh, from one end of the beach to the other end. His, mo his mother is desperate. His friends are desperate. Everybody tried to speak to, with this guy and he stopped talking to them. And Glissant too, whose house is at the Diamant facing the same beach, began to try to talk to the guy and the guy wouldn't talk to Gleason for some time until one day the guy is passing, Gleason just waved at him. And then the following day, the guy is passing, the guy also waved at Gleason. Then they began to communicate. And Gleason realized at that point that he needed to make an effort to get in tune with this person. And in order to do that, he needed to get in tune with nature, with the environment with the ecology and all these things. So I was really moved by that, you know, it, it, because as a person, you know, as a Malian born and raised in Mali, educated in Europe and the United States, I always thought that the most important thing for me was to learn how to think in a dialect, dialectical, in a modern way, uh, enlightenment like Franz Fanon taught us like Césaire taught us. It wasn't until I met Glissant and we become friends that I began to realize that there are other ways of feeling people, of understanding people, of relating to people that was not necessarily coming out of this thesis under thesis, this oppositional relation. So this is why I love that small chapter in that book. It's a very beautiful chapter and of course, it's so relevant also uh, for now because of the importance to enter in a communion no, with the environment. Because you, you describe how Glissant really enters in a communion 
with the, the beach called Diamant, and where actually the vegetation, the sand, the sea are becoming yeah. characters which are as important as human beings. And it's interesting because this brings us also to uh, Sylvia Winter and actually the, the, the book Alexis Pauling Gams, the, the book Dab has written on, on Sylvia Winter. And, and, and you know, Alexis uh, Pauling Gams says that we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other through technology to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way that allows us to be actually in communion with yeah. our environment, as opposed yeah. to a dominating colonialist separation from the environment. That seems to be all in that chapter. It's the link again between Lisa and Silvia Vinto, no? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, Gleason says, you know, la terre tremble and la terre pleure. You know, because I mean, it's, it's unique to be in Martinique and Guadeloupe because they have, you know, uh, in, uh, earthquakes, they have uh, volcanoes, they have uh, hurricanes. So they really uh, see nature. They feel nature in a way that we've lost this feeling with nature when we are in the city and we think that only our daily activities in the city uh, uh, of existence. So Gleason c'est la terre tremble and you know, the earth has, it's not only trembling, but it has a language. And we have lost this language. We used to understand this language. His argument is when he was little, I mean, you know, Gleason is also a poet, as you and I know. He, he said when he was a young man in, in Martinique, he used to hear the water coming down the, from the rocks. And as he grew up, the environment changed, he couldn't hear the sound of the water coming. And still today, when he wants to be creative, he has to go to these origins to hear the water coming down from the rock all the way to the valley. So we need to tremble with the trembling of the earth. We need to cry with the crying of the earth. So the danger is always in front of us and we refuse to see it. And it was so important for Gleason to get in communion with land in that sense. Uh, and then to also not only to get in communion, but to realize that we could have a, a, a thought now in this communion with the land, we could have a thought. And we think this thought only we have it. You know, we so uh, intuitive, we, only we have it. But the truth is that at the same moment that we are feeling this intuition, this thought, this communion with the land, the same thing is being felt in the Amazons in Brazil. It's being felt in Japan. It's being felt in you know, the remotest places in Africa, you know, in Timbuktu. Uh, so what do we need to do most of the time is how to, uh, can you hear me? Perfectly well, yeah, yeah, thank okay. you, it's great. So what we need to do is create solidarity of intuitions. Yeah. We need to create a solidarity of intuitions so that uh, this communion can become a new uh, solidarity, political solidarity. He said, this, he said, I don't like politics, but this is on the only area we need a politics, the politics of environment, the, pol the solidarity with the land. He, he was really always adamant about that. I don't know why I don't see you, so but let me try. But I can see you perfectly well. Okay, all right, then let's talk. If you can see me, that's fine. Then. Yeah, it's perfect. So the creating of solidarity of, of intuitions and uh, it brings us, of course, also to your project in, in Senegal. We are doing this conversation today whilst you are actually in, in Senegal. We're working on the... Back to Earth project uh, together with you for the Serpentine uh, exactly. on this project, which is deeply related to what Glisson calls, you know, the activism of natural surroundings. I mean, Glisson told you and me again and again that we have to be in, in, in active in activism of natural surroundings. You call it yeah. also activism of uh, of the environment, and you are, of course, 
in Senegal in a place where the landscape, the vegetation and the sea are clearly characters as important as human beings. And, and you're working with, with the fishermen, the, the pebble collectors, the migrant pelicans, uh, there are the floods. Can you tell us a little bit about this project, how you came actually to this house in Senegal where you spend a lot of time now and how this project of, of activism of natural surroundings started to happen? Actually, thank you very much for, for bringing this up because I, my sense, I thought we were just talking about creolization, but I'm glad you're bringing this up. Uh, day before yesterday, I finished filming a fisherman because uh, I told him to show me his village. What was really brilliant, uh, his way of showing me his village was to show me the three wells that were dug during the colonial time at the turn, at really beginning of the 20th century. They were dug in his village, in different spots of the village. So he took me to these three wells and told me people still get water from these wells whenever the, the, the you know, there are serious water crises in this area. So whenever they, there is a crisis, there is no water, people go to the well and uh, pull some water up. He showed me that. And then he showed me if, uh, at least three or four, three, uh, where, which were the first trees in the village, in the village ever. Uh, and the significant thing about these village, uh, trees is that one of them is where the villagers, the chiefs, uh, they meet whenever for weddings, for circumcision ceremonies, for, for crises, funerals, and so on. And then at some point he said to me, you know, my father, uh, who was a chief here, uh, when Europeans were coming from Dakar to the village, he could see them coming. Again, it's this communication with nature, with the environment. He could see them coming. If they are bringing good news, he knows. If they're bringing bad news, he, uh, he also knows. And then usually when it's bad news, they make uh, bees meet him on his return. So he doesn't get there on his arrival. So he doesn't get to the village. So he told me that. He also told me about his grandfather. This was moving to me, uh, who was one of the biggest fishermen in the village. And this man, before the fishing started, he would go to the ocean before everyone else and then do some communions. And then he stands in his pirogue and begin to wave in different directions to the fishermen, like, go this way, go that way. Because I had asked him, I said, when you're standing there with your net, before you throw it, you wait and wait and wait. Uh, what are you looking at? He said, well, I don't have the power of my grandfather, but what we do now is, I look at the water, when the waves are moving, sometimes we see fish coming and then we throw our nets. But sometimes we only see curves with the, with the waves and certain curves look stronger than other ones. So it's obviously a fish that's moving and I throw my net. So I was already impressed by that. But he said his, great, his grandfather being a great fisherman could just be in front of people and his eyes closed. He's telling the uh, pirogues, the canoes to go in this direction and that direction. They will bring fish and feed the whole village for days. and. You know, and he was gesturing and say they tie one rope there and tie one rope uh, over there and then they pull the uh, pirogues in and the whole village come and get fish. So th there is that communion there too. And then the environment, of course, he showed me where they used to keep all the uh, the les hôtels où on garde les divinités, you know, the, the hostels where they had all the the little parts, the mask, all kind of stuff that they used to consult before going fishing. Now that uh, place of that altar for worship has been completely wiped out by the ocean. He said the ocean was like 50 meters away from that. But today the ocean has come and destroyed that. So and then through the was, climate change, this exactly, divinity disappeared. Exactly, yeah. So, and then he, he showed me another place like that where you know they 
they will bring uh, all the, the fishing material and board things. Again, the, so we filmed all this. It, it, was re, it was exhausting. It was amazing, exhilarating. Uh, and, and then at some point, I said, well, what do we do? Pebble collectors are collecting pebbles. Uh, they're collecting sand. And then rainy season, all the dirt is washed on us. Uh, what are we doing? And then he said, well, let me tell you something. Even you are part of this problem. It's not just people who throw things in the water. It's not just the fishermen coming from Europe and China to get the fish here and then dump oil on us. He said, when you build your house, you build your house, not only you use sand, but you also bring a lot of rocks that you put in front of your house. Now, when the ocean is trying to move around and breathe, your rocks are actually blocking the breathing of the ocean. So the ocean goes somewhere else in order to breathe harder and then throw more water on them. Mm -hmm. So this was his way of explaining uh, you know, the way the sea is advancing. Scientifically, I can't verify it, but the story was very convincing. Amazing. So you're doing this film and of course, the film goes towards what and it's basically what Lisson called the poetics of ecology. So yeah. I wanted to ask you, tell us a little bit more about how one can do a poetics of ecology. And I'm interested also in it being a kind of a campaign to, to change the situation, because of course you mentioned the packaged products from supermarket, which lead to the homogenized taste at the expense of local products. That's Something right. Lisa always pointed out as well. He always said that the homogenized globalization, this is why he talked about mondialité and not yeah. about globalization. Mondialité is something very, very different. Yeah, yeah. mondialité is, uh, for Glissant, a way that, you know, your space at any time, any given time, call into existence in the space of another person and so on. So all these spaces are in solidarity and they are all in communication and there is not necessarily no hierarchies between these spaces because if something happened to my space, sooner or later it's going to happen to your space and it's going to happen to another person's space. So it, having that feeling of mondiality is well, that poetic relation, that sensibility is really glissant. Uh, he, he, he has most respect for those people who, who can feel the land like that and know that the land is not a territory, that the land is a space in solidarity because territories usually like nations, they discover, they conquer and they colonize. Whereas if land is not territory, then land is in interdependence with other lands. So it, having that feeling uh, gives you the sense of mondiality, as opposed to what you were very well describing just a minute ago uh, about uh, prise unique, you know, supermarché prise unique, where they, you know, everything is one dollar. So we all wear the same things, and yet we think we are special, and uh, but we are also destroying the land. We have no, you know, we do mass production of these things and so on. So, so uh, mondiality, which he refer also to as lieu commun, lieu commun, like I mean, you know, both in French and English, like common places. The, the ori original meaning could even be a little bit vulgar. You say everybody knows this. It's Saint Leo Common. This is a common, common place. But he said, I like to write it with a hyphen between Leo and Common. So if I have a dash linking them, what I'm saying is that all these places are interdependent. Because he, he always says this, and this used to bother people, particularly from Africa, Latin America, people coming from decolonization phases. When Gleason says, we have gone from colonialism to uh, decolonization to independence. Gleason said, this is not enough. We, the, the last phase has to be interdependence. We have to begin 
to depend on each other because everything that happened to the weakest area is going to happen to the strongest area. So into this theorizing of interdependence, it took people a lot of hard thinking to understand it. Still, you know, you have people in a positional thinking. You know, uh, I do this, it's against what uh, Hans Ulrich is doing this, that. So, uh, but if you realize that what I'm doing uh, depend on what you're doing, depend on what someone else is doing, this interdependence is so important to theorize than the dependency theory. The dependency theory, the oppositional theory, or the theories of decolonization, which are very important. The moments came, resistance theory, all very important. But until we realize interdependence, Glissa is saying we're not there. We need to get to the point of interdependence. You know, Samir Amin was right with his dependency theory. Fanon was right with his decolonization, uh, oppositional thinking. Uh, and then the independence generation, the nationalist generation. But really, we needed to get to this moment where the weakest place and the strongest place become interdependent. They begin to build solidarity and a new aesthetic. You know, I mean, you know this very well, a new way of going into, uh, into what you call two monde. The two monde, uh, the baroque these are some of the words that, you know the new totality you know totality used to be you know coming from mali uh, i would i would say our culture is the whole culture coming from switzerland you would say the swiss culture is the whole culture of france and so on but glissant said no all those are totalities then uh, open to other totalities and the real totality will never be closed because there will be always new cultures coming up and questioning the totality that we have. Now, how will the project evolve in, in Senegal? Because you're going to do the film for the, for the Serpentine, for Back to Earth. But as you said, it's, it's, it goes beyond the film. It's also a campaign. It's, it's production of reality. Like Lisa, I mean, he always said, you know, we need to go beyond the book or the film. He started institutions. He started not only his schools in Martinique, he wanted to, uh, of course, create his museum as well. He was always talking about that, about actually right. building right. his institutions. How do you think we could this project in, in Senegal beyond the film produce reality? Absolutely. You know, I had a, you know, a young lady uh, from the director of the Henrik Ball Foundation, the Green Movement in Germany, she came to have lunch right before, you know, you and I start talking. And I was trying to explain to her that I'm making this film. Uh, and once we get past, we, we reach the theory of interdependence, I need to figure out what can I do here? And as you know, Hans Ulrich, I was also, uh, I was last week, uh, in Guadeloupe, looking at the Glissant Fund, the, the Glissant uh, Art Collection. You know, we had there more than 155 artwork uh, that Glissant had uh, acquired, either by writing reviews or buying or friends gift and so on. And this collection include people no less than Roberto Mata, uh, Cardenas, uh, Ulfredo Lam, uh, Le Boeuf, all kind of artists from Mexico, from uh, Latin, different parts of Latin America, uh, to France, to Belgium, to Africa. He has a huge collection. So Gleason thought that this collection uh, needed to be a museum because, as you know, Gleason used to uh, do art criticism for a gallery uh, in Paris. So he, through his uh, work, what uh, uh, become obvious to him is that all the artists that he, he was working on and his own work, they were feeding onto each other and they were trying to get to 
another world, another world of uh, thinking, another world that was, you know, beyond oppositional worlds, you know, uh, French versus Africa or you name it. They, they wanted to meet there. So to really come back to your, your point, which is very crucial to me that I was talking about with this uh, young lady, I, I need to find out how to stop an association here where a pebble collector's voice, the fisherman's voice, and my voice would all contribute to creating something new in this area that would go beyond collecting pebbles or subsistence fishing, but not some, uh, some situation where uh, we can just do uh, a brutal development of one thing or another. How do we create uh, a situation that can help save me from the background that I'm coming from, save them from the background where they're coming from? So we, we are trying to do that. And uh, the film first would be like a kind of letter that I'm writing. And again, I'm thinking of some of the people who influenced me people like Jean Rouge, Chris Marker, Alain René. So how do I write a letter? And I've been writing these letters to uh, Rebecca, uh, living uh, in a serpentine. Keep telling her the kind of things that I've been encountering here. So uh, this letter is a questioning of myself, but also my attempt to understand without fully understanding what the people are doing here and how our lives can come together, can merge and create something else. This is really what I think this film is gonna do for me. It's gonna be uh, a lot more than what I have been trying to do uh, in the US as job requirement, like writing an academic paper or making a film but this, I will be really involved in this. This is what I, you know, but not, but not only me, but my collaborators, the other people who are also working with, it, with me on this. Wonderful. A last question is, and we're of course very excited uh, with Back to Ours to, you know, show the film uh, later this year in London and hopefully continue, you know, to collaborate also on that next step when it becomes a, an association, when it becomes related to the production of reality. The last question is, of course, a lot of that has to do, as you say in one of your letters, um, to, to resist the dehumanization brought on local societies by capitalism and by, as Glissant says, by the, the violence of, of, uh, of globalization. And you say that every island is an open-ended discourse towards something new, unpredictable. It's a very Glissantian idea. And by doing so, this idea of challenging and subverting these dominating systems. You, you often told me that you, 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 you believe in the role of opacity, the Glissantian right. opacity. And that's another recent text you wrote, actually, which is very, a very beautiful text, uh, also at the end of last year. This idea of lack of, of transparency, or Glissant talked about untranslatability, about unknowability. Um, uh, opacity, that all of these notions have this um, potential, no? this radical potential for uh, a movement of change. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Glissantian opacity for all of this? Yes, uh, it, it, it's really the crucial point. Uh, again, I, I tell people uh, sometime in jest, but sometime I'm very serious. I tell people that Fanon taught me how to think and Glissant saved my life. What I mean by this uh, beyond hyperbole is that Fanon, Césaire, uh, people like Semben Usman, during the decolonization movement, they taught us in Africa how to think. But we were mostly thinking in an oppositional uh, discourse. And when I went to the US again, my very close association uh, with members of Black uh, Panther Party, people like Angela Davis, very good friends, uh, Amiri Baraka, 
they taught me how to think, but uh, it, it, the, the thing that was very crucial that you can see, especially in people like Angela Davis, you can also see in Jen Cortez, but especially in Edouard Glissant, is that it's not, it's not enough to think. It's not enough to understand. Je comprends ceci, je comprends cela. Because he said, thinking and understanding, as important as they are, they are also attempts to possess the other, to make the other transparent. I understand this, I understand that, and therefore I understand you. Therefore, you know, I can assume you, I can subsume you, I know who you are. A glissant say, you never know who I am because I'm, I don't know myself who I am. I'm always becoming, I'm always in the process of becoming. Uh, what he call être étant. You know, être is in the French philosophy. Je pense, donc je suis. Être quelqu'un. Uh, whereas étant is something that is always in the process of uh, an unpredictable way of becoming. This is what was important to Glisson. And when we consent to opacity, the au opacity, and then consent to the opacity of the other, then we can begin to cultivate a communal space, a collective space. There was a glitch in the line. So you said, you said uh, to cultivate and then it cut. Yeah, it's only after we consent first to our own opacity. We don't know everything about ourselves. We don't know why we do some things that we do. And then we consent to the opacity of the other instead of trying to own the other and understanding the other. We can say, well, this person, I have to approach this person in a tremulous manner, in a trembling manner, because I don't know everything about this person. And then we be, after consenting to that person being more complex than you assume, then you begin to cultivate a collective opacity. You begin to cultivate collective ways of relating to one another between individuals, between collectivities, but also between nations and the whole world. So opacity therefore become almost a right to fight for, for glisson, you know, because the UN is just saying, here is the law, but how can you apply a law to people that they have, a law that people have not experienced and you punish them or you reward them with that law? Glisson said, that doesn't make sense. We have to, you know, fight for the right to opacity. 